Young Women's Leadership Summit, are you ready to see this degenerate, rotten culture that we've been living in get a makeover? Well, you are in the right place. I see so many incredible 70s Inspires outfits right now. I see sequins and stars and stripes and big floral prints. You guys nailed it. Every year you take this theme and you run with it. I love to see it. And you know, we didn't pick this theme on accident. We picked the 70s because that decade fundamentally changed the narrative surrounding women. What our role should be, what our lives should look like. But all these years later, I'm not sure that was very good advice. Are you? Politics, this is gonna be spicy. Politics should not be a priority right now for conservative women. It should be culture. And here's the thing about the 70s. In the 70s, women were given all sorts of lies. Things that we were told were going to improve our lives, make them better, make it so we would be more equal to men, right? In fact, they just told us, well, you can be a man. And I guess we've kind of accomplished that. But are we happier? <laughs> the thing about the 70s is that women were very vulnerable. We were coming off of a decade like the 50s where women were miserable. And how many of you have heard the left villainize the 1950s? Raise your hand. How many of you have heard conservatives idolize the 1950s? Raise your hand. What if I told you that both of those narratives are being misrepresented? You see, the truth is that women in the 50s were miserable, but it isn't for all of the reasons that we're told. We were living in a time where conveniences were going crazy. Women had all of a sudden, we had microwaves and dishwashers and all these things. We had oven, oven uh, pre-made dinners that we could just stick in the oven. Everything was easier. And so women felt purposeless and a little bit decorative. And with that came a really deep feeling of discontentment. One where the feminist movement preyed on those feelings and told women, you know where you'll find your true purpose? You'll find your purpose outside of the home, not in it. And women were joining the workforce at record rates. And the thing is, is that we abandoned a lot of the biblical principles that God put in place that would make women feel very fulfilled We bought into this lie by the feminist movement. And it didn't work out for us. We've never been more depressed. We've never been more anxious. And so what I'm here to tell you is, if you were to just go back to biblical roots in what God had designed for women to do, we would be happier. It's not necessarily what the right says or what the left says. And I really want to focus. I really want to focus on four lies of the feminist movement, okay? So I'm going to go through four things. And if you've ever listened to my podcast, The Spillover, you know that I get. I like to keep it five orange juicy. I didn't want to go vanilla on you today. So we're going to do four lies that the feminist movement told women. 
We're going to start with birth control. Who in this room has decided to ditch hormonal birth control recently? Wow. Wow. Okay. How many of you are considering ditching hormonal birth control? Okay. That's incredible. I'm just, I'm honestly, I'm just going to tell you right now, I'm just waiting for my slides to catch up to me and I'm in the birth control section. <laughs> Aha, here we go. Okay. A lot of women were under the impression that hormonal birth control is this one-size-fits-all magical pill that will allow us to be able to pursue a career first and then have a family later, right? Finally, we're going to be able to do what I was saying, which is put a career first. We're going to live like a man. We're going to be a man. We're going to act like a man. But here's the first bomb that I'm going to drop on you. Birth control was actually not created to help fight for equality. Birth control was invented by Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood in the 1950s. Now, why would Margaret Sanger support the idea of birth control? Well, she was a proud eugenicist who theorized that undesirable populations, aka black and brown people, could be reduced or eliminated by controlling their reproduction. In fact, you know how the birth control pill was approved in the U.S.? This is going to freak you out. They did human experiments on women, but they didn't do it on white women. No, they did it on women in Puerto Rico. Margaret Sanger partnered with the Procter and Gamble heir, Clarence Gamble, who agreed Puerto Rico would be the perfect place. Everyone is poor, and as eugenicists, Sanger and Gamble wanted to wipe out the poor to make room for more so-called fit people in society. Does that sound a little familiar to you? The women who took birth control in the 50s were not given any safety information about what they would be taking. Some of them actually died or ended up infertile. They were just told it would be a great idea to control when they had children since they didn't have a lot of money at the moment. By 1970, women started to correlate. It's been 20 years we've been taking this pill. All of a sudden, we're starting to notice our depression. We've got heart problems. We have decreased sex drive, weight gain, blood clots, and blood clots, and more, all due to this pill. The Nelson Pill Senate hearings held by men who had never taken the pill tried to downplay the health risks and advocate that it was safe and should stay on the market. Here's the kicker. They all had relationships with Big Pharma. Several young women in the audience, though, were ready. And they were jumping up and down, and they were saying, uh-uh, this is wrecking women's bodies wrecking us and no one is listening to us and you know what they did they kicked them out of the hearing let me be clear the only people testifying at this hearing was big pharma not the women sounding the alarm on the side effects of the pill and until this hearing we did not have a warning pamphlet that we get that we get when we get our pills that wasn't in the packet not until this now we call that a patient package insert, but our doctors rarely ever review it with us when they prescribe it, do they? Women around the world are now realizing that the birth control pill doesn't heal any reproductive problems. It just suppresses symptoms. For many years, you may think that your endometriosis or PCOS has gotten better, when in reality, your hormonal birth control is just masking these issues so you don't have to deal with them until you do. Years down the road when you decide that you're ready to have a baby and now you're racing against your biological clock to fix your problem. Why are we talking about this at a conservative women's conference, you ask? Because as conservatives especially, we should never blindly trust anyone when it comes to what's best for ourselves or our families.
Medical journals and psychology reports say that women using oral contraceptives may exhibit personality changes, altered emotional memory, recognition of anger, risky decision making. There is a reason why girls get off birth control and they feel like they just met themselves for the first time. It is completely altering your personality. It takes time for our bodies, sometimes years, to fully rid itself of the toxic waste left in our, our systems by birth control. We're prescribing this as early as 14 and it has the power to affect her attraction to others and her sex drive. One study out of the University of Sterling found that those not taking the pill when they met their partners generally found their other halves to be sexier. We, this is crazy, we are attracted to different types of men on the pill versus off. So not only do you have to remember all of these side effects that you might be dealing with, you have to remember and be mindful of how it influences your attraction to others. Oh. By the way, did you know that birth control is a class one carcinogen? Here's what they don't stress in high school health class, and I promise you this is all important and it all ties to a bigger picture. It is healthy for women to have a natural period. Our period serves as a way for our female bodies to tell us if our hormones are balanced or if something isn't quite right. A lot of women don't know this, but the period that you have on the pill is not a real period. If you've been on the pill for years, you may not have had your real period in decades. And in what world did we think that wouldn't have any negative consequences on our health? What this really means is that if there is something seriously wrong that could contribute to fertility issues later, you have absolutely no way of knowing. And you should also know that many, many birth control pills are actually abortifacients meaning the pill can often end early pregnancies by preventing the implantation of a fertilized egg. This is all very much by design. Margaret Sanger was very interested in her advancement of abortion towards her eugenic goals. So let's talk about abortions. Contrary to the feminist narrative, when you get an abortion, you will not feel free. You will not feel equal to men. You will feel traumatized for life. It's not a matter of if that feeling will come, but when. Sometimes women feel it immediately, but if you talk to a woman who has had an abortion, and I have talked to many of them, that feeling of overwhelming guilt and shame can sometimes hit them years later. Having an abortion is a personal, lifelong, emotional prison sentence. There are no survivors. For years, but especially now in the aftermath of Roe being overturned, amen. <laughs> Pro-choice feminists want you to believe that taking the abortion pill will just be like having a painful period. Maybe you'll experience some cramping, but just throw a heating pad on, pop an ibuprofen, you're gonna be all right. Oh, and also, Try not to look as you're tossing the embryo in the trash or flushing the baby down the toilet. And do it fast. They say that because they know that if you see what is undeniably a human being in the toilet, you're more likely to re realize the truth of what has happened. Women who have had abortions have come out in record numbers claiming that they are less happy and increasingly more confused, miserable, and lonely. But by the time the trauma sets in and they realize these undeniable truths, it's too late. What's done is done. And even in those very heartbreaking cases of abortion after sexual assault, data shows that PTSD for women doubles because it isn't her rapist she gave the death sentence to. It was the innocent. Like I said, there are no survivors. Despite this, abortion is portrayed as an act of self-love. 
by the progressive left. We've all heard it, haven't we? Love yourself first, prioritize you. You are perfect the way that you are. Do what makes you happy. And this is exactly what abortion is a byproduct of, a narcissistic love of the self. Get ready, get ready. The problem isn't that women don't love ourselves enough. The problem is that women love ourselves too much. And I wanna be clear, we must have compassion for women who have had an abortion. And if you are here today and that's you, I want you to know that we love you. Love, Love and compassion must always remain at the forefront of this issue for the weak, the vulnerable, and heartbroken. And after all, we know that a loving father is near to the heartbroken and no one, including you, is beyond his grace and forgiveness. <laughs> On the topic of heartbreak and struggle, there's also the other end of the spectrum. Which brings me to another truth, the truth about big fertility. There are tons of rabbit holes that I could go down and inconvenient truths surrounding family planning, and I have done a lot of that on my podcast, The Spillover. But since we're specifically talking about the you-can-have-it-all culture created by the feminist movement, tonight I'm just going to speak to the women who see IVF as a sort of safety net for putting off having a family in pursuit of a career. You need to know that the feminist movement and the fertility industry are like this. Big fertility has a vested interest in the feminist movement effectively brainwashing young women in the height of their fertile years. They want you to believe that your 20s and 30s should be devoted to your career and that your 40s are the time that you should start thinking about having a family. Here's what you need to know. According to the Human Reproductive Journal, by your mid-30s, your chances of getting pregnant drop to less than 30% even on your most fertile day. It is uncomfy and frustrating to say that fact out loud but it doesn't make it less true. It doesn't mean that it's impossible by any means. Tons of women get pregnant older, but it is important for young women to accept this as a reality. Big fertility knows that women like us who have just spent close to two decades climbing the ladder have money to spend and that we are desperate. The fertility industry is going to gamble on your potential misfortune for their profit. Plan accordingly. Our female biological clock is always ticking, and despite what popular culture will have you believe, maternal age directly impacts the effectiveness of IVF. Now here's the spiciest take, and we're gonna wrap up. Are y'all ready? I believe that a lot of mothers in the 70s who desired freedom and flexibility or who didn't necessarily have a support system were oblivious to the fact that the solutions presented to them as safe, liberating, or harmless were anything but. And one of those solutions was daycare. I just got real uncomfy. Did you feel that shift? <laughs> While it may have made life easier for moms, infants and babies did not, infants and children, I should say, did not come out unscathed. These solutions came from the very feminists who didn't value motherhood or children to begin with. When daycare was invented in the United States in the 30s, the goal was to be a last resort for the single moms, widows, and low-income families with no multi-generational help. But just like everything else, over time, it was twisted and accepted by society as the new normal. And let me tell you something, just because something is normal or common doesn't mean that it's right. I 
I believe the feminist movement is in large part to blame for the fracturing of the traditional home, where women were coerced outside of their natural roles as mothers into the workforce. The feminist movement gave way to the notion that a woman could have her cake and eat it too. You can have the career you want, and you can raise your children in a positive educational environment, a.k.a. daycare. And that's, the, that's a whole other thing, but that is a lie to tell women that we can have it all. We can have it all, but we have to plan accordingly. It might have to happen at different times. We were told when it came to daycare, that parents can nurture their child's social, emotional, intellectual, and behavioral intelligence by surrounding them with other kids their age, but studies show that isn't true. Have you ever heard people say like, oh, my kids are in daycare, they need to be socialized. At a certain age, there is no recorded correlation between exposing a child under the age of three in a school setting to any real increases in educational intelligence, social skills, or overall IQ. In fact, daycare kids are more likely to develop behavioral problems. The NICHD study shows that what is best for a child in the first few years of life is to be with their mother. And that probably isn't necessarily surprising. I know a lot of women in this audience are like, okay, we know this. But here is the bombshell that I recently learned that illustrates how serious that bond between a mother and a child is. Changing diapers, nap time, feedings, they may seem like basic, mundane things and needs that can be done by anyone. But what no one tells you is, in those little tiny moments, it's in those moments that psychologically a child's attachment style is built. Now, is anyone in here familiar with attachment theory? Have you ever heard of this, seen it on TikTok? They post a lot about it in regards to our romantic relationships. It was, it was created or discovered, I should say, by psychoanalyst John Bowlby, and he discovered all of us have what's called an attachment style. It's a psychological bond that is built between parent and child within the first few years of life. And that attachment style that we develop forever affects how we relate to people for, for the rest of our lives. All of us fall into one of these attachment styles. They're secure, anxious, resistant, avoidant, and disorganized. The goal is secure. And whoever the primary caregiver is, whoever the primary caregiver is, meaning whoever is spending the most hours with a baby or toddler throughout the day is who is going to shape that. And that may not feel fair, but it is true and it is something to keep in mind if you're going to choose the working mom route. So remember, we're talking about everything. There is a pro and a con, and I want women to know the truth so that we can be radically thoughtful in our choices. No one wants to talk about these less than ideal attachment styles and how they're created in those first couple of years. It is totally downplayed to working mothers because people are more afraid of hurting an adult's feelings than a child's development. My friend Katie Faust, anyone know her? She's been on the spillover. She has repeatedly said, adults should do hard things Sorry, I said this wrong. She has repeatedly said, adults should do hard things for kids. Kids should not do hard things for adults. And some people want to scream, well, you don't know my situation. You're right. I don't. I don't. And when it comes to this topic, the age of the child matters, the hours they're spending in daycare matters. Some people spend 15, some people's kids are in there for 30, and a family's socioeconomic status matters. That will all determine a different outcome, and that information, depending on your family, will put your child at a higher or lesser risk for cognitive development damage. If you must or want to work those first few years of their life and you have a choice when it comes to who watches them, do absolutely everything in your power to avoid a daycare setting, no matter how expensive or nice that daycare seems. Remember that before the age of three, 
the downsides vastly outnumber the substantial advantages. And there are two important takeaways on daycare that are simu simultaneously true but also scary. One is maternity leave in this country is not even close to being enough and it is utter trash. But as I'm about to explain in detail here, the damage-free solution we're giving being daycare is erroneous. You have to plan ahead for this decision that you will have to make in your life as women. There is a reason why children who spend their first couple years of daycare, of their life in daycare, I should say, tend to play more aggressively than kids who don't. According to the Goldstein study, it's partly because they are competing against other children for the attention of their caregiver. Those kids in daycare have higher cortisol levels than kids who stay at home. And here's the thing about higher cortisol levels. Not only does it affect behavior negatively, it also weakens your immune system too. So this is why daycare kids are always sick. Here's the thing. Ooh, this is uncomfortable. There is a tier of child care options. Some are better than others. There just is. But even conservative women tend to have trouble separating emotionality from this reality. We have an ideal standard of what a family should look like, right? But that's not a demonization of single moms. There's an ideal standard of what a diet should consist of. But that doesn't mean we just discount allergies. Here, have the peanuts. Oops. There are always exceptions and outliers. And that being considered, that doesn't negate there being an ideal standard for how early childhood development should look. And I know that can make some women feel enraged or upset. However, this is about opportunity cost. You can eat junk food very inexpensively. However, its consequence may be that you have really bad health consequences down the line. After high school, you can choose to go straight into the workforce or go to college first. Each of those is going to have a consequence on your immediate financial situation. You can choose to do daycare before the age of three. However, its consequence may be that they have significantly worse behavioral and attachment issues later in life. And for some families, that is the better alternative. Okay, hear me on this. As opposed to not making enough money to put food on the table. I understand that. That is for you to decide, not me. I just want you to have the truth about these risks well before you ever have to make them, ideally. Opportunity costs exist everywhere a decision must be made. It's not a pro pro-feminism idea to acknowledge, okay, but that is the point. With both daycare and birth control, for example, even conservative women have allowed the tendrils of feminism to invade their mindset without even knowing. And it just speaks to how pervasive the feminist movement of the 70s really was. Once kids are involved, it's not about what's best for us, it's about what's best for them. This requires unbelievable amounts of humility, selflessness, and planning. Don't wait. Think about it before you start a family. Depending on how old you are, think about it before you go to college. Remember earlier I said you have to be radically thoughtful with your choices. Sometimes we will have to sacrifice our personal happiness for our families. So if it is possible in any way, we should be putting our own pursuits on hold for the well-being of our children those first three years. It really is as straightforward as that. And there is a large group of you who will dismiss what I'm saying and discredit my opinions because I'm not a mother. A lot of women think that it takes becoming a mother to be able to speak to these issues with any credibility. And I get that. I understand that everything in your life changes when you become a mother and it influences every single decision that you make, what you value, how you see yourself. But in the same token, saying that because I'm not a mother yet, my argument should be dismissed is a logical fallacy. And in my opinion, a cop-out. 
saying that there are personal exceptions to the arguments I am making as a way of dismissing my ideas is also a fallacy. We understand that it's good to have a standard for what ideal government looks like. We have standards for what an ideal marriage looks like, standards for ideal health. I mean, the list goes on and on. But the second the conversation reaches ideal standards about childcare, it's too controversial and nuanced to talk about. For far too long, women's emotions have been preyed upon by the feminist movement and the experts, okay? We have not been allowed to ask questions because that's how they're able to control the narrative. This is probably the one and only time you'll ever hear somebody say this in a positive way, but conservative women, you should have trust issues. <laughs> Do not elevate your trust in any scientists, doctor, teachers, podcasters, above your own instincts as women. We do know when something seems off, unnatural, or insidious. This is what makes women so distinctly different and special. Men will never and could never understand it. Make whatever decisions you want as a mom, as a wife, as a woman. All I'm asking is that with whatever choice you make, to get married young or take the dream job, to homeschool or not, to stay on birth control, to get off birth control, to send your kids to daycare or sacrifice financially so that you can stay home. Do it in confidence, not ignorance. Don't say, why didn't anybody tell me this? I'm telling you. You know why I wanted to work in the conservative movement? because I felt like it was lacking a female voice who felt like a best friend. I wanted heart to hearts and secret sharing and discussions of hopes and dreams. And I experienced that at my first YWLS and my biggest wish is that for all of you to experience it too. So then someday you can look back on this and you can say, remember how insane Alex Clark was in 2023? <laughs> I wanna leave you with one of the most meaningful truths, okay? Heroes and heroines aren't people who choose what's best, what's easiest, what's comfortable for them. They choose what is right for their character, their family, and their community. They choose to sacrifice themselves for something that is greater than who they currently are. And I can't tell you what that path is or what that answer is for your life, but what I can tell you is that you need to be radically thoughtful as a woman today in America with all of the options and access to opportunity that we have. Now there is a new best friend in this room for every single person. Your goal is going to be, I'm giving you homework. If you watch Pop Politics, then you know I give homework. Your goal is to get three phone numbers by the end of this conference, okay? Three new phone numbers. And I want you to say hi to anyone who seems like they don't know anybody here. I want you to invite them to lunch or dinner with you and your friends. The future of America is in this room. We are not falling for the lies of the feminist movement anymore. We know the truth and we are doing something about it. Now everybody stand up with me. I want to do a little experiment. If you listen to my podcast, The Spillover, you know how I end every single episode. I end it by saying, it's a tradition, love you, mean it, bye. So what I wanna do, and I've never done this, I'm so excited. I am going to say, love you, mean it, and then you guys are all gonna shout bye. Are you ready? All right, big voices. Love you, mean it, bye. <laughs>